Good morning. How are we doing this morning? Good. Everyone can stand. My name's Mike Simafanti. I'm the youth director here. Uh, and I have the privilege and the honor of, uh, of opening service today. And I was praying and I said, Lord, what do you want to speak to your people? And he gave me Psalm 22, verse 3, which says that the Lord, Yahweh, is enthroned upon the praises of his people. And you guys are his people. And I want to encourage you that your worship matters. Your worship matters to him and to you. Why? Because everyone's heart is a throne. And on that throne can be a myriad of things. It could be the health and the the prosperity of your children. It could be your own health and prosperity. It could be so many different things. But that throne deserves, one one person deserves that, that seat on the throne. And that's God. And the way you go from seating other things and couching other things upon your heart to putting him on your heart in, 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 in that position is through your worship and through your praise. Because the word says in Psalm 22, verse 3, that he is seated and enthroned upon the praises of his people. And so your worship matters. It matters in this moment. Why? Because whatever you came in with, you have the opportunity to, to dethrone that thing and enthrone the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to pray for grace right now. We're going to pray for grace for the Lord to dethrone the thing that is, is, it's important to you and it's important to him. I want you to know that. But when you're about his business, he'll be about your business and he'll take care of the thing that has been entangling your mind and your heart. But it first comes by seating him and enthroning him on the seat of your affection and on the seat of your heart. Amen. So let's pray. Let's close our eyes. Holy Spirit, we ask right now in this moment that you would take the thing that has just been overwhelming our hearts and our minds, the thing that is important, it's not evil, it's good. And we ask that you would reorder it, you would re-rank it in our hearts and our minds so that we would put you first and, and, and first alone. That as the first commandment in the 10 commandment says that we would have no other gods before us, between us and you that you would be number one, that you would be, uh, you would be seated in that place of affection. You would be seated in that place of honor. You would be seated in that place that only a king should be seated. And so right now, we lay down the things, we cast our crowns, we just lay everything at your feet and we wanna take up the praise. We wanna uphold the praise that you and you alone deserve because you paid such a high price on the cross. We bless your name. Father, we ask for grace right now to give you high praise, to glorify you, exalt you, and seat you on the throne that is reserved for the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Yahweh, the one who was, the one who is, and the one who will come. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Yes. 
That's it, just fix your eyes on the King, fix your eyes on Him. Oh, we really love you, Jesus. We love you right now. That's it, turn your eyes, turn your gaze. We really love you.
get your affection, your attention on Him. Oh, we really love Today, children of God, we really love you. Oh, we love you right now. Let him hear your voice this morning. Oh, we really love you. Oh, we love you right now. of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, oh, praise him. hallelujah, thou burning sun with golden beam, thou silver moon with softer gleam. Blah. 
didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin, my sin was great. Your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name.
upon his feet like a drink offering just pour it out before him today the Lord is bending his ear to listen to the song of his children just begin to lift it up today let it overflow this morning Jesus, we just thank you, God. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your faithfulness. And God, we just declare today with one voice and one heart that God, we don't want to sing songs today in your honor as though you're dead. We want to look you in the eyes today and leave room for your spirit to move among us in our worship that you would lead us Jesus that you would have the room that we would wait on you God wait for a fresh wind from your spirit for a fresh fire to grip us for a fresh oil to pour over us oh Jesus it's your room it's your room it's your church, it's your work, it's your world, it's your morning. Oh Jesus, we don't wanna sing songs to you in your honor, like this is a memorial service. Jesus, you're alive and you're speaking and you're moving. Thank you, Lord. So we want to interact with you, God. Jesus, if you don't show up, it's not church. 
It's not church without you, Holy Spirit. So we just ask, even let's uh, put a hand on somebody next to us and just pray. Lord, would you increase your movement, Holy Spirit, in their life? Oh, that they would begin to feel the wind of the Holy Spirit in a new way in this season. Father, I pray for my brother and my sister that this would be a season marked by a move of the Spirit of God within them. Open up their heart. Open up their mind. Open up their theology to leave room for you, Holy Spirit, to do what you want to do. Jesus, we're your body. Would you get everything you want? Jesus, get everything. Have it all. Have it all. God, we might not be brave enough to pray over ourselves. Have it all. It's a little easier to pray that over somebody else. So pray that over the person next to you. Jesus, have all of them. <laughs> Lord, just take all of them. They'll pray it for you. <laughs> it's a little easier that way. Lord, Lord, just let them give you all. Give them a fresh grace to turn it all over to you and see wonderful miracles in this season. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Man, I love worshiping with y'all. You can find your seat this morning. Hello, church family. Welcome to today's service. My name is Dylan. And my name is Dennis. Let's take a look at today's announcements. Easter is next Sunday. We encourage you to bring your family and friends to our Good Friday service at 7 p.m. and our Resurrection Sunday service at 9 or 11.30 a.m. Ancient Paths 2 is coming up on April 12th and 13th. This is an intensive time of sharing, prayer, and ministry focused on various topics, such as freedom from shame and softening a hardened heart. Sign up in the lobby or by visiting eventbrite.com. If you are a partner of SGT, mark your calendars. Our next partnership meeting will be on Sunday, April 14th in the conference rooms following second service. We look forward to seeing you there. Thank you for joining us this morning. For everything else happening at our church, pick up a copy of our bulletin or visit our website. We would love to connect with you if you are new to our church, so please text SGT NEW to 94000 or visit the Welcome Center in our lobby. Resurrection Sunday is coming and we are so excited to celebrate with our church family. This year, we're also gathering for Holy Week. In the Gospel of Mark, Mark uses the word immediately over 30 times in the first 10 chapters. Most scholars attribute this to the fact that he's rushing to tell the narrative of what happened from Jesus' triumphal entry to his death and resurrection. We can learn so much from the journey Jesus Christ took on his way to the cross. The holy disruption of his love in our homes and our workplaces, how to forgive our enemies, and understanding what it means to count the cost of following him. As a church body, we'll gather together in person on Monday night, Wednesday night, Good Friday, and Resurrection Sunday. On Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, we're posting online devotionals that challenge us to take what we experience in the sanctuary here to our world out there. So we're asking you to mark your calendars from March 25th to the 31st and participate with what the Lord is doing in our church. That's tomorrow. What day is today? Oh my goodness, are, we, are, are you not sure? Stop listening to that phone so much. What day is today? Sunday. What day is tomorrow? Monday. Hey, listen, I'm not trying to sell anything to you because there's really no product you're going to come to tomorrow and Wednesday and Friday. I would just say, if you find yourself that you're hungry for more of the Lord or you are in need for more of him, you don't have to know the next step. You're just hungry for more of him. And you're in need of more of him. Come on out. 7 p.m. tomorrow night. Come on out and let's see what he wants to do. Not what we have planned, but what he wants to do. 7 p.m. right here. Tomorrow. And what day is tomorrow? 
that we're getting better. And the day after that is Tuesday. Isn't it exciting? We get to do life together. And life is a gift. And we pray life is overflow. And I want to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed. And will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. And you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on some occasions. No, on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but it is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Our heart here is not to invite you into charity. Instead, it's to invite you into a lifestyle of generosity. Charity is a little easier, and you can check it off the list. Generosity is something you bring with you everywhere you go. It's overflow. That's why the work of Jesus Christ to us isn't charity. It's the generosity of his love. So I'm encouraging you, church, that when you and I step out and we are a generous people, in all that we do, our resources, our tithes, our offerings, yes, here in the house and what God's doing, that's great, pour into that. But also, there's a world outside that needs that same generosity, that same kindness, that same mercy and forgiveness. Your skills, your gifts, your talents, your profession, you're the ones walking in there. And when you do that, and it's not just charity, but it's generosity, guess who receives all the glory? Not you, not me, him. And they give thanks not to you or to me, but overflow of thanksgiving unto him. So Lord, may we do this. But more than doing it, may we be it. May we be a people, a family, of generosity from everything of our resources all the way to our profession and the emotions in between and the realities and dy dynamics in between. Lord, may we be a people who are generous to see others and to see others give you thanks. In the name of the Father who loves us, the Son, Jesus the Christ, who stands beside us and the Holy Spirit who gives us strength to live this out. Amen and amen. You're looking like a little tired today, you know? I feel, like, I feel like you need to stand up and stretch and then you need to reach beyond yourself and give somebody a hug and say hello. Can you do that? Thank you, Veronica, leading the way here. Can you stand up? Thank you, George and Franca. Why don't you stand up, get to know somebody around you, say, hey, we are blessed because we come in the name of the Lord. Oh, Jesus.
we like to hang out here. You can see the really extroverted people right now. They're like, we're supposed to go for 10 minutes, right? Who likes talking to people? Raise your hand. Let's be honest here. Oh, it's okay. Who doesn't enjoy talking to people? Raise your hand. It's all right. All right. There we go. There's some honesty here. You're raising someone else's hand. The spouse is like, they don't like talking to me. Hey, you know what's great? We get to be together. We get to be together. (laughs) We get to have family. And maybe for some of you, that word family feels very broken right now. But what's awesome about our family is it's not defined by a personality or a person. It's defined by God as father. That's why you can have a lot of dysfunctional or broken people in the family of God because he keeps reminding them that they're his children. So I pray today you're reminded through the kindness of others and the smiles of others and the embrace of others that you are loved and you are family. Not because of them or because of me or because of an institution, but because of him, a good father. Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry of Jesus coming in to Jerusalem. And what did they say? They said, Hosanna, Hosanna. Lord, save us, save me. It's a declaration of a people who needed a savior from oppression, the authorities and powers of Rome and taxation and abuse. We need a deliverer, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the son of David. We need a king. Shattering the image of king. That's the title today, but I pray it's much more than a title. I pray it becomes a reality in our life. That whatever we hold as images of God, perceptions of God, and what it looks like or means for him to be king, that suddenly those images are shattered in our encounters with him and the reality of who he is and the depth of who he is. Can we pray? Why do we pray? Just to say some words to get us to the next thing. We pray so that we can lean into a God who's already leaning into us. So Jesus, we come to you. You are here just as much as you were there thousands of years ago on a dusty road. You're here. We lean into you, Lord. We need you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We're in awe of you, God. That you, almighty God, would be with us. How humbling and how beautiful. May we lean into you. May we lean into you right now. Any distractions, even the things ahead of us this week or the failures that we carried into this place or the shame, As we lean into you, God, may those things fall off so we can hear you, who you say that we are. In Jesus' mighty name, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen and amen. I hope today in this moment we're presented with the reality of God. That we're understanding the revelation of God, the true form and not a false image or fractured image of Jesus, but the true Jesus, beholding the person of Jesus the Christ and not holding on to our own images of God. See, an image of God is God customized to our requirements. It's God being customized to our requirements, and so we have this little image of him. It would be like me saying, here's a picture of Anna and I have it. And I go, look at Anna and she's awesome. And my interactions with her. And I'm like, almost you're like, why are you trying to interact with this portrait and this image of Anna when she's right there? And what would be the difference? I don't have to explain it to you what the difference is. 
There's dialogue, not just monologue. There's response, there's interaction, there's experience, there's encounters beyond myself. And also, I can't control her. I can't make her respond in a certain way. And so there's a little bit of a fearful thing in that as well. In the reality that she is not customized to my requirements. See, the image is a God with all of God taken out of it so that we can continue to be our own gods. And we have pleasure in creating and making this image of God because we can control it. We enjoy control. Some of you are like, yo, I thought we were supposed to get palm branches out and start saying Hosanna, and it was gonna be like, yay, 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 he's come, he's the king, and then we leave. Listen, this is actually so much more exciting. I'm not inviting you into some performance because Jesus wasn't performing that day. I'm inviting you into a relationship with the living God where our images can no longer hold anything against the reality of who he is, the person of Jesus Christ. That's exciting. It does require some work on our end, but deeper than that, some surrender. See, Jesus comes into the human condition to bring us into the revelation of God, and he shatters our God fantasies, what we think he should be like, and our God lies, what we say he should be. He reveals himself to us. He shatters that image as if Anna would come up and say, give me that picture. Here I am. And in that shattering, there's a moment for us. There's a response for us. The question to us, will we follow him? And so there in this triumphal entry, a broken people, Jesus comes into the story, breaks into the scene of a bunch of people waiting on a line to get into Jerusalem for all the feasts that are taking place of the unleavened bread and the Passover. They're going to have a good and holy religious experience. But now, in the midst of that, they're interrupted by him in his presence. Matthew 21. Jesus comes to Jerusalem, the holy city, as king. And as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them and they brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. And a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. There would have been branches, palms, where dates would be produced, And they would have taken those off, which was symbolic of life and fruitfulness and hope. And they would have put those palms down. They also would have taken their clothes off, the jackets that they had around them, the clothing that they wore, the robes. And they didn't have a ton like we have, just so you know. It wasn't like, I've got 10 jackets, which one do you want? They had one. It was very special, it was very sacred, but it was a laying down. And they would have done this with many other former Kings and leaders, when they would have announced their kingship for the people, the people would take their outer garments off and lay them down so that the king could walk on them. So it's this really sacred and deep moment that's happening. And the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven, not just the heavens that we see the atmosphere, the sky, the sun, the stars, but no, beyond that, the presence of God himself, the place where his presence resides, now here with us, save us, God. From that place, God, save us, Hosanna, in the highest heaven. 
And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred, shook, agitated is even what the word means. And they asked, who is this? And the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of a king coming in to a city to inaugurate his kingdom in a new and deep way, to reveal to everyone his power and his authority and his might, I would think of him coming in on a horse, right? like on a horse, on something epic and beautiful. And listen, donkeys were special and sacred to the, to the family and the people there, but it was much more familial than it was kingly. And many kings in the past, what they would have done is when they would come into a city, when they would march in to show their authority and their power, they would lord it over everyone, which means they would come in with power as a lord to say, look at who I am And what I wield, my authority. But Jesus came in a very different way. I mean, in one sense, he's kind of breaking the fourth wall. The fourth wall in acting or theater or performance is suddenly when the monologue of what was written in the script is broken by now a dialogue with the audience who's there. And now the acting stops and it becomes almost more alive to the moment that we're all really here right now. This is a performance and this is real life. And the fourth wall is broken. And Jesus is doing that to the scene of humanity with how they understand what it means to be a king and the kingdom. This isn't some sort of performance. He's not performing. He doesn't flip the switch. (sighs) <sighs> Gentlemen, disciples are on. Three, two, one, king. That would have been my kingly walk. I'd be like, yo, give me the biggest, baddest horse we've got. Put some blood on it. Put something on my face. If I'm about to declare my kingdom, if I'm about to have people cheer for me, he's not performing. It's not like he's different there in that moment than he was when he was a carpenter. He was just as kingly. And when he'll return one day and the heavens will break open and he will come down on a horse as the king of kings and lord of lords written upon him and declare to the world, king. But he's just as much king right there on a donkey. And not just on a donkey. See, there was two of them. There was the donkey, who was the mother, and then there was the baby donkey, the colt. And he rode that one, tied to the mom, because that one would have gotten scared because it had never really been ridden before, and there's a lot of loud people. And so he's not riding this epic war horse, coming in, declaring his authority. He is on the baby donkey, tied to the mom, because the baby donkey's a little afraid. And he's coming in. See, suddenly what Jesus begins to do is deconstruct our image of what it looks like to be a king in his kingdom. And when God shatters our images of him, it adjusts inside of us our posture before him so that we can actually be with him. Because my posture changes when Anna comes up here and she's actually before me instead of just a picture of her that I can carry around. And so as he's doing this in us now, let him adjust us. Let him begin to take those images and those ideas we have that we've capsulated God within and change the whole narrative to break the fourth wall See, a horse was representative of a conquering king, of war and strength, because they knew when they came into a new land and they came in with authority and power, others would want to challenge that authority and challenge that power. 
And so when they marched in, they would be on a strong and mighty horse to show they could conquer and that they knew what war was. And they would bring war upon anyone who would challenge their authority. And so there was a strength that came from that. But in the ancient world, if a leader or a king came in on a donkey, what they were saying was, I am bringing peace, gentleness, not war. I'm bringing peace. Zechariah is the prophet quoted here, saying one day the deliverer, the savior will come and he will come in a different way and he will come bringing peace and it will change everything. Jesus would bring peace through his own suffering, not by administering suffering upon others. I mean, who is this king that he would take his power and authority? All kings would say, I need power. I need authority. I will hold it. I will hoard it. I will lord it over you. But he comes and says, I will give you power and authority. The one who releases power and authority unto others. He came in to remove humanity from the chaos of the world brokenness of the world. He wasn't bringing war. War creates more chaos. War creates more brokenness. Instead, he was entering into the chaos to bring us out of it. Do you see the parallels and the differences of what he's beginning to do? And you know what? I'm sure people there just as much as people now when we see what Jesus enters in on and what he does are disappointed, are disenchanted. I had that plan, this epic music during this moment right here and now. Someone's phone, thank you. Where were you at first service? I was starting, that, that ain't donkey music. That's more like a horse than William Wallace, please. You can shut it off now though. But I'm sure people were disappointed. I'm sure they were disenchanted with the reality of what was happening. <laughs> people online are like, oh, she's running out. Well, the Lord bless you. <laughs> Cell service is bad everywhere else except in the sanctuary. What is that? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. But as Jesus comes in on a donkey, we know there's symbolism there and there's meaning there and there's a depth there, but you have to understand the reality that people didn't want that. People were oppressed, people were broken. They were in a world that was holding them down. They were under the captivity of Rome. I mean, Rome was a fearful power. Just the word Rome and the Roman soldiers and the Roman legions, when people heard that, they already started surrendering, even if they were miles and miles away. They would send messengers out to say, we surrender, whatever you need, Rome. So they're saying, this is our deliverer, save us, because they actually need saving. Please take us out of this oppression that we're under. And I'm sure when they saw Jesus come in on a donkey and a baby donkey tied to a mommy donkey and his humility and his graciousness and his goodness, they were a little disappointed, disenchanted with the scene and the moment. But see, Jesus isn't an image customized to our requirements. He's not customized to our requirements. Well, this is what it would require for you to come in and change this whole kingdom and free us. This is what you would need. You would need an army and this type of power and this type of authority. But Jesus wouldn't be customized to the requirements of the people of that day and age and Jesus won't be customized to the requirements of our day and age and us but he will definitely storm in, march in, trot in to a broken people to bring them into his wholeness and healing. So what happens when we're disappointed with God? Well, you could be honest. Remember, this isn't a performance here. 
There's no flip of the switch where now let's talk God and Jesus and surrender. And then when we go out there, man, my prayer is that if I bumped into you out there, in the world, in the chaos, that I would see peace in your life. Even greater, I would see you glowing with Jesus more out there than in here because the lights are on in here, but out there, the lights are off. It's not a performance. Jesus wasn't performing. He was on mission to his Father's will. So what happens when I'm disenchanted with how things go, God? When I'm disappointed with how he's doing something or hasn't done something. You know what that disappointment can do? It can turn to surrender. You're like, that's not what I wanted to hear. That's what it's always gonna be. When you're disappointed with how things are going or the way in which God is doing something, you have a choice. You can either abandon and keep doing your own thing or you can say, well, if you're God and you're king and this is the way that you do it, then Lord, I surrender. And when you're disenchanted with how it looks and the way everything should look and our idea, our preconceived ideas, our images of what it means to be a king. I mean, he should have came in on a horse. He should have had a sword. He didn't have to use it, but at least it's like, you know, it's a power statement. And all these things, this disenchantment that we feel. And how is he going to free us from Rome like this? How is he going to do that? Why is he speaking about peace? I mean, God's always done it this way. Why is he not doing it this way? And all those moments where now we're disenchanted with the way it looks and the way God even looks in the midst of our circumstance. You know what can happen? We can let it turn to discipleship. We can let it shift us to say, okay, so obviously the way that I think it should be done or the way I think I should look and you should look isn't the case. So now, Lord, make me like you. Teach me your ways, Jesus, that I may walk in them. And our disenchantment becomes an opportunity to be discipled, to look more like him, to talk more like him, to be more like him. Because Jesus moved forward in life and this journey different than the world would have wanted him to and many times how we would have wanted him to. When I say move forward, I'm saying in the statement like when I look at you and go, so what's your plans ahead in life? What's your goals? What are you reaching? How are you gonna get there? And how are you gonna move forward in that journey to reach those goals, to achieve those things you want to achieve? But see, Jesus moved forward very differently to fulfill his Father's will. He wasn't gonna do it the world's way or the way we thought he would. There was no separation of who Jesus was and what he was doing. There was no separation between the two. Remember I said it wasn't a performance. It wasn't suddenly where he's going, I'm acting now. And then when you meet me outside of the stage, I'm a very different person. Well, that we would expect from an actor, right? We would expect that, that who they are and who they're portraying were really convinced in the moment and on the stage, but when you bump into them outside in the quote unquote real world, they're not that same person. And sometimes we have that misconception of God and who he is. This wasn't a performance. He was still going there through Jerusalem. He didn't have every step of his journey planned out for 30 years before the three years of ministry that he did that he goes, remember on this day, I'm gonna go here and do that. Remember, I'm gonna, he was just who he was and doing what he was doing because he doesn't change. So even as a carpenter in the workshop and the one baptized where the father says, this is my son, and the one way back who was born in a manger and was lost as a little boy until they found him in the temple speaking to the educated, the words of God, every moment and all the anonymous decades in between. He didn't have the switch off. He was always king. He was always the light of the world. He was always the prince of peace, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, son of man and son of David, son of God. See, there's no separation. There's no separation of his presence, who he is, and the movement, 
what he does. See, we like control. We like control, raise your hand. You don't want a smart car that drives you. Did you ever see those videos of people parallel parking where the car does it for them? So scary. You know they just were like, it's probably the first time they're like, I'm going to trust the technology. Boom! They're like, we like control. So we make an image of God based upon our expectations, our preferences and our assumptions of what he should do or how he should do it and how we expect him to do it and how we would prefer God to do it and even how he would look and act. And it's easy to fathom and hold on to that when it's an image that fits in our box. There you are, God. The nice thing about the box is is you're like, it's a gold box. My kids love gold boxes. They think it's gold. They think everything gold is gold. I find all the stuff, I'm like, guys, it ain't treasure. One day you're gonna find out. But till that day, they're just enchanted by it. It's a gold box. And so we have these boxes. We have God right in this box, in this gold box. And the great thing is, you know, I can kind of leave it here or take it here. I can separate the two. I can make a separation. Remember I told you though, Jesus, there's no separation of who he is, the person of Jesus Christ and his holy presence and what he does. When he walks into a space and when he rides into a city, everything begins to change. There's a movement happening. There's no separation between the two. But we like that separation because we like to make one between the secular and sacred things. Because the sacred things is where he's Lord and God and and he has the control. Hey, in church, in my prayer life, if I read the scriptures and have a devotional moment or a conversation about God, all those things, hey, you are in control. But over here, in my work, my day-to-day, the things I watch, the entertainment, the times of fun, the habits I have, my marriage, my relationship, those things, you know, I'll have control over them. And if I need to bring the God box into it every once in a while, I will. It'll feel good, it'll be nice, but what we don't realize is something. The reality is you can't separate him. See, the people wanted and assumed that they needed a political messiah a nationalistic king. And it would result in what history revealed as a bloodthirsty revolution. But it's not on them. We don't need to point at them and say, how dare you think that? That's how, that's how it happened through history for them. They were under the oppression of others and all of a sudden, a political messiah and deliverer rose up and delivered them. And there was a lot of mess and there was a lot of bloodshed. And so they had their assumption and their ideas, their expectations of what he would do and how he would do it if he was the Messiah, if he was the deliverer, how they wanted him and how they preferred him to work and move forward in this. But their perspective, just like ours, was limited, often only temporal. And he was doing something eternal. He wasn't just a deliverer for the time. He was the eternal savior for all time. All time. And it's in those moments that people began to have some unmet expectations. Their assumptions were wrong. Their conclusions were incorrect. Their preferences wasn't what God preferred. They were more self-conscious than God conscious. They were limited to a historical moment and they were missing out on the movement of what he was doing for all eternity. The separation of who God is and what we let him do in our life is very dangerous. Like I said, it's a separation of the secular and the sacred we begin to set aside a sacred place and a space for God to honor him. 
almost like a little shrine that we can visit. And we say it's to honor him, but the reality is it's intended to keep him in his place. It's intended for us to keep him in his place. And listen to me, this is convicting for all of us, but my prayer is that you realize what we're walking into is an encounter with him and not an image of him. We're encountering and walking into not a shrine of God and what he's done where we smell certain smells and feel certain feels, but we're being invited to walk into the heritage and inheritance of what it means to be in a family of God, but see if we just simply wanna keep him in his place, then we will settle for the image. And I can carry around with me anywhere I go a little picture of Anna. That little picture of Anna can follow me wherever I go and do whatever I tell it to do. Doesn't that sound like a great marriage? It begins to sound nice, but then you realize you've just created a prison of self. And so we think that we're following him, but we've just got a little image of him in our pocket that follows us around when really we're being challenged, convicted, called out to be followers of him, the king and his kingdom. See, when we keep him in his place, we have the final say in everything. We have the final say in everything that happens outside that little space of the sacred. But there is no separation. The worship team can come back up at this time. There is no separation of the sacred and the secular. There is no performance that Jesus turned on with what he did and who he was. But we settle for that in our journey with God and then we wonder why our marriage is falling apart and then we wonder why our relationships are toxic and we wonder why our finances keep sending us down a cycle of poverty and we wonder why we can't find happiness with all the things and material we surround ourselves with and we always sit in this place of wonder thinking why and yet the reality is we've compartmentalized God to keep him in one place when he's inviting us into something much bigger and deeper and wider. And so there, the King of kings and Lord of lords rides into Jerusalem on a baby donkey next to a mother donkey while broken people yell out, Hosanna, save us. What images do we have in our life of who we think he is and how we think he needs to move and what we say he needs to do See, when God won't stay in his place, when he won't stay in the box we've put him in, and that's where suddenly, right after this moment, the next day when Jesus comes to the temple and he begins to turn the tables and flip the tables and say, this is not how it's meant to be. This is not what God's heart is. All of a sudden, then they go, okay, now you're out of place. So you do the whole marching thing and it was fun and people screamed and hollered at you and put the palm branches down. Okay, good. You could stay in that lane. You could stay in that place. We're glad you didn't come with the horse, but we know that no matter what, in a few weeks, this will all die out because Rome will come in and squash this. So that's not gonna happen. But then when he stepped into the temple and the courts and the outer courts and he began to turn the tables, they said, okay, now you've stepped out of your place. This is our place. This is our religious experience. This is our zone. You're not allowed in here. You can do what you want out there, but you can't come in here. But see, you cannot separate who he is and what he does. See, realize to us, people of God, that when we invite Jesus into our life and we surrender our life to him, that's everything. And you might think that sounds scary, but I'm telling you, look around the room at the saints who have been in it for decades, and it's beautiful. And I was talking to a saint after first service, a gentleman who's a leader here, who's walked through a lot of pain. And when his first wife was dying, he said it was painful to see what that cancer did to her. And he said, Pastor Stephen, if I didn't have the true image of Christ, the encounter with him as person, and just an idea and an image of what he should have done, then after that storm and that pain, I would have never kept following. 
but it's the true understanding of who he is that brought me through it. See, that's beauty. Even though the reality is a lot of pain. And when God won't stay in his place or the box, there's two responses we can have, but there's a third one that's holy that we should have. The two we can have is this, we deny him. And that's what his closest friends and disciples were just about to do a week later. He didn't fit into the image that they had and they wanted, so they denied him. And one didn't like the image at all, so they decided to exchange him for some silver. But if God won't stay in his place and in his box, the other response is that we suddenly change our hosannas, hosannas to crucify him. Crucify him. One week later, so fickle. Because we're in love with an image and not the one who invites us to be made in his image. So church, I don't know about you, but I know what I want my response to be. See, there's a little moment at the end and that little moment is the tension we should always be in as the people of God. It said the whole city was stirred and they asked, who is this? The crowds, like I said, they were waiting for their religious experience. They were waiting to go to the thing they would go to every year and have the experience. They were good and they were God experiences, but they weren't encounters with Almighty God. And now it's interrupted. And the whole city was stirred, shook, trembled, agitated. So what about for us? What do I do then? How do I not have all these images of who I think God is? Never stop being stirred by the person of Jesus Christ. Never stop. Never stop. When concrete stops being stirred, what happens? It gets hard. And we have a people filled of hard, calloused hearts because We stop being stirred by the goodness of Jesus. I was with my dad just a couple days ago and we were sitting down and we were talking. You know what he said to me? We were just chatting and he said, Stephen, and this man is one of the most faithful saints I've ever known. And I know more about him than anyone else here. And he looks more like Jesus in the privacy of his life than his public life ever did. You know what he said to me? Hey, Stephen, just one thing. Just remember, it's all about Jesus. Like, it, it sounds so simple, but let it just circulate every part of your life. Jesus, never stop being stirred by Jesus, the person of Jesus, that when I say his name, that you begin to weep because of his goodness and his faithfulness, because of the reality that he's alive and he's real and he's here with us. Never stop being stirred and your Hosanna won't change to crucify. You'll praise him in the storm and you'll praise him on the mountaintop and you'll weep with him in the valley and he'll be with you through it all. Because images can only take you so far but the person of Jesus Christ will take you now and hold you forevermore. Never stop being stirred by Jesus. Never stop. And never stop asking, who is this? Who is this? Don't lose or give up your awe of God. Don't let the world Throw the rubble on top of your awe of God and bury him in your life like some whitewashed tomb that you go to and visit that has the words God written on it and that's your experience with him. Don't you dare because he'll never be put in a box again. Never lose your awe of him. Never stop asking, who is this? Who is this? I'm broken. I'm broken, I'm an addict. 
I'm broken, I'm lustful. I mean, the lust of my eyes and the lust of my flesh and the greed, I'm broken. And he comes to you and he comes to me with love unconditional and healing that's eternal. Who is this? Who is the one who holds all things together? The one who breathed life itself into existence, who before Abraham, he said, I was because I am. that is in the midst of our broken circumstance right now and even hangs out in the room of our distractions, patiently waiting for us, humbly coming into a city of broken people, knowing that what he was about to do was not a bloodthirsty revolution, but instead he would spill his blood out to get us back in. Who is this? I mean, who is this God that we call Father? Who is this all-consuming fire that invites us in and doesn't burn us but embraces us? I mean, who is this? You think you know who he is? We don't know who he is, but we can know him and not just an image of him. Because see, if, if we lose our awe, if we stop being stirred, then we'll trade and exchange him for an image. Not in this house, not in this house. Let's not exchange him for an image. Can we stand up today? And all I would do here and now is as we worship, just let him deconstruct you a bit in the goodness of his presence. Let his presence speak to some of your unmet expectations and your disappointments and your disenchantment with him and how you thought your life should be. And all I would say is just make room for him. And you watch what he does. This world.
Oh, Jesus, would you forgive us? Would you forgive me, Lord? For even in a good heart, the images that we've created of you, that we've given ourselves unto and denied you, the person of Jesus Christ. Would you just turn us, God, as a people? In the grace that you give, would you just turn us? Repentance, the turning, God, changes everything. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. If our humble king could stomp out pride with the hoofs of a donkey, can we not humbly come before you and say, forgive us? If you've never embraced the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, if it's been on the outside of your life, oh, let him on the inside. If you've just visited a shrine of Jesus in the morning and left him the rest of the day, realize he's waiting to go with you through your day. Actually, he's waiting for you to follow him through his day. Just say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, forgive me of my sin, of my brokenness. Let me be in awe of your love. Stir your grace and stir your mercy in my life that's shattered. I love you and I need your love. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice, for your bloodshed, so I can live both now and forevermore. In the name that is above every name, the name that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, declaring the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. We love you, church. Our altars are always open. If you need prayer, you need someone to be in the struggle with you, come on down. And let me tell you, if you're looking to lay down some images tomorrow night and be disrupted, come on out 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary for a holy disruption of his presence. We love you.